I think uh, we're about ready to get started. It is truly a pleasure to introduce Dr. Dirk Molliver. He is a professor here and has been here since 2014. Uh, seems like yesterday. Um, he got his PhD at Washington University in St. Louis and then went on to do a postdoctoral fellow at Volum Institute at the Oregon Health and Science uh, University. And his interest is really focused on um, finding out function of GPCR uh, receptors. And today he's going to talk a little bit about that in relation to development of chronification of pain. Thanks. Thank you very much for that introduction. And it's uh, great to be here to have a chance to talk about what we've been doing in the lab. Uh, in the last few years, is have really been something of, of a scientific adventure for us. Uh, and uh, so the project I, I want to tell you about are really the two projects represent a, a whole uh, slew of, of new techniques that, that we have uh, with painstakingly and with some occasional missteps brought into the lab to really uh, build our, our capabilities to answer questions and, and using new technologies that, that I really have not used prior to coming to, to UNE. So that's been uh, a really exciting process of, of learning for me. And I just want to say that the, for the most part, the work that I'm going to show you has been done through the intensive efforts by uh, Ramaz Gegushads, who's a research assistant professor in my lab, or Diana Good, who's a postdoctoral fellow. So when I say that we've done something, that generally means that, that it's been either Ramaz or, or Diana. Uh, so we're exploring molecular mechanisms of pain, pain chronification. What does that really mean? Uh, explaining that is not helped by the fact that it means different things to different people. Uh, in general, what we mean by that is, is that it represents the, the idea that there are fundamental changes in the transduction and transmission of stimuli leading to, to pain between acute pain, uh, which is generally health promoting, protective, and chronic pain. Uh, and even the, uh, the definition of chronic pain is, is somewhat subjective and has been used in different ways, uh, depending on the context of how people were using it. Uh, John Levine last year gave an excellent talk on this topic. And he mentioned that pain is generally, chronic pain is generally defined as a unit of time. If you have pain for three months without getting better or six months, that's chronic pain. But in fact, there are real mechanistic differences between acute and chronic pain uh, that really we should be focusing on when we're defining something as chronic versus acute or ongoing, unremitting acute pain. Uh, and in fact, the situation is probably further uh, complicated by the fact that it's very unlikely that there's only one form of chronic pain. Uh, even though the patients response may be very similar, and they're, they're, they may simply say, you got to help me, I'm, I'm in terrible pain. But the mechanisms driving that may be substantially different, uh, even within the realm of chronic pain. Uh, and this is just a summary slide from Rohini Kuhner's uh, review article. And I just wanted to mention the distinction between uh, peripheral pain mechanisms and central pain mechanisms. There are certainly plastic changes that occur in the transition from acute to chronic pain, both in the peripheral nervous system and in the central. Uh, and it, presumably at every synapse um, in which, through which pain or nociceptive information is conveyed, there's an opportunity for plasticity and processing of that information. Uh, and so it's likely that there are, are changes in the transduction and transmission that occur uh, both in the peripheral sensory neurons and the dorsal ganglia that, that we primarily study uh, and at various sites within the CNS. But we, my lab has traditionally focused on the peripheral nervous system, uh, 
uh, in part because it's very rare to have a pain syndrome clinically that can't be at least transiently ameliorated by a, a peripheral nerve block. So that if you just if you block the input of the ongoing input of, of sensory information, you can at least transiently relieve ongoing pain. Uh, and there are also certainly going to be changes in the CNS that in how the brain uh, receives and processes that information. But a critical first step is inputting that information into the CNS in the, to begin with. And that's, uh, so that's where we're, we have traditionally focused. And an example, a concrete example of, of this sort of plasticity that I'm talking about is uh, pain syndromes in which opiates are not very effective or have reduced efficacy uh, in some forms of chronic, particularly neuropathic pain syndromes. And also a, a good example uh, from a pharmacological perspective is the use of gabapentin. Uh, Neurontin or, or Lyrica uh, to treat neuropathic pain. Those drugs are very ineffective for acute uh, inflammatory pain, but a certain proportion of uh, neuropathic pain patients receive dramatic benefit from, from using those drugs. So there are fundamental changes in the nervous system that have occurred that allow these drugs to be effective uh, or conversely, allow drugs that are very effective in acute or inflammatory pain to be uh, less effective in, in a, some chronic, chronic pain syndromes. So a key question is how you go about uh, excuse me, uh, modeling this process. So what, is, what are the, the molecular events, the, the memory in the neurons of an initial injury or a disease state that causes this prolonged uh, transition in, in how uh, pain or nociceptive information is being processed or input into the CNS. Uh, and John Levine and colleagues developed a, a really intriguing model uh, for studying this sort of transition from acute to chronic pain that they termed hyperalgesic priming. Uh, and in this model, you have an initial uh, insult or injury, which is a, so this is essentially a, a model for, for inflammatory pain. Uh, you have an initial insult called the priming event. And in many, most cases here, as shown here, you use an injection of carrageenan into the, the hind paw of a mouse or a rat, uh, which generates a, an inflammatory insult, an inflammatory response that causes hypersensitivity to noxious stimuli for a few days, and then it resolves. But uh, after it resolves and the animals look phenotypically normal, there's something different about these animals. And we call that the primed state. Because if you wait, and you can wait for weeks after the resolution of that hyperalgesia, and give another insult, normally a very mild insult, and again, here the traditional uh, stimulus is a, the prostaglandin PGE2, uh, injected into the hind paw generally causes hypersensitivity for a few hours and goes away. Uh, in primed animals, you inject the PGE2 into their hind paw and they have uh, dramatic hypersensitivity for days instead of hours. And so the, this provides a, an opportunity to look at the molecular events in uh, the peripheral neurons and also in the central neurons uh, to see what has changed about the transduction of that stimulus. That, that allows uh, this normally mild insult to be dramatically increased and prolonged. So PG2 uh, acts and prostaglandins act at a family of prostanoid receptors, the, the known, generally known as EP receptors, which are G-protein coupled receptors. And so this is just a quick refresher for people who don't think about GPCR, G-protein GPCR, G coupled receptor signaling pathways on a regular basis. Don't seem to have any pens here. Uh, are they hidden? Oh, thank you. We'll see. Okay. Uh, 
So the traditional, the canonical signaling pathways for G-protein coupled receptors are GQ, GS, and GI. GI for inhibitory, these are the uh, opioid receptors uh, among many, many others. GQ act primarily through uh, release of, of calcium int from intracellular calcium stores and the production, the activation of protein kinase C. GS or the stimulatory uh, uh, G protein subunits act exclusively through activation of the adenylcyclase enzyme family of enzymes which produce cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP can signal either through protein kinase A, which has uh, been the, the canonical pathway for many years, or the more recently identified EPAC uh, effector, which is a, um, which is a, uh, an activating effector for RAP. And that can also activate protein kinase C under specific um, under specific circumstances, which is unusual, which is a, a sort of novel, non-canonical signaling pathway because the adenyl cyclase pathway and the GQ, phospholipase C, PKC pathways are generally thought to be, or thought of as uh, completely distinct sort of parallel pathways for nociceptive sensitization. Uh, and then GI coupled receptors, these the inhibitory receptors act in part through shutting, by shutting down the adenyl cyclase pathway, so the GS coupled pathway. Uh, they're also capable of inhibiting calcium influx through voltage dependent calcium channels, uh, suppressing excitability through opening of, uh, of potassium channels. But a major, the GI GS interaction is a major mechanism for regulating nociceptive tone or the, the state of sensitivity of peripheral nociceptive neurons. And then these kinases, either PKC and PKA, go on to phosphorylate ion channels and receptors that contribute directly to the neuronal response properties of the sensory neurons. So these are mechanisms for, for making nociceptors hypersensitive, hypersensitive um, or restoring normal sensitivity to the, the peripheral nociceptors in response to environmental stimulation. And GPCRs in general are, are uh, they're, so they're the single largest family of transmembrane receptors that act to, to um, receive external stimuli in order to alter intracellular events. There are over uh, 400, there are about 400 non-olfactory receptors and somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of currently use drugs target GPCRs or their signaling pathways, uh, depending on how, how you do the counting. So they represent an enormous and diverse resource for drug development. Uh, and so we're looking here at, at prostaglandin receptors, which are, the, for the most part, the, the ones doing the, the business end of the PGE2, and those receptors are GS coupled receptors that are acting through adenyl cyclase. Uh, and so the question here is how do you go from a stimulus activating this receptor that's transient, uh, only causes hypersensitivity to a few, for a few hours, to a dramatic change where you have days of hypersensitivity in response to this mild stimulus? And I'm, so I'm going to be focusing on this relationship here on the regulation of adenyl cyclase and how you get from protein kinase A uh, to EPAC. So one thing that I should mention is that the transition uh, that John Levine's work has shown that the transition from uh, a naive to a primed animal where you get this dramatic uh, increase in, in hypersensitivity requires a transition from signaling through PKA, which lasts a few hours, uh, to signaling through EPAC to protein kinase C, specifically these isoforms, epsilon and alpha. And so part of this underlying molecular switch in the priming phenomenon is this transition from adenyl cyclic AMP signaling from, through PKA to EPAC. And so 
when we started looking at this, we wanted to look at, at what are the mechanisms that are driving regulation of adenyl cyclase and EPAC. Why is EPAC suddenly being uh, activated when previously it, it was not accessible to the pools of cyclic AMP? Uh, when I naively started looking at this a few years ago, I thought, like many people, of, of adenyl cyclase as a monolithic entity. You know, you have a, this enzyme, it generates cyclic AMP, and that's pretty much the end of the story, right? But there are nine isoforms, uh, and each one has a really different regulatory profile. And so I have a, this is a, a very simple uh, summary slide of the different isoforms. Now, the, the genes are known as ADCYs. Uh, they're often referred to as AC for adenyl cyclase when you're talking about function. In general, I'll try to use ADCY, but if I slip up and say AC, you know, you'll know what I'm talking about. So in particular, one of the things that I got very excited about when I started looking into this was that there are three adenyl cyclases in green known as type 2 adenyl cyclases, which are, which are unusual in that they're completely insensitive to inhibition by GI coupled receptors, by G alpha I. Uh, and so that mechanism is, is not functioning uh, for these isoforms. And in addition, they can be in the presence of the G beta gamma subunits of G proteins uh, in combination with G alpha S, they can be super activated so they produce dramatically more cyclic AMP. And this uh, can include the beta gamma subunits that are released by GI coupled receptors. So this, this was a, a concept that really captivated my attention and thinking about the idea that you could have a type of adenyl cyclase that not only is insensitive to inhibition by the G alpha, um, by the G alpha I inhibition, but it could also, also be super activated in the presence of the beta gamma isoforms released by these receptors that are normally analgesic. Uh, but of course, the question was, are these even expressed in sensory neurons? And which isoforms? You can't really understand regulation of adenyl cyclase unless you understand which adenyl cyclases you're talking about. Uh, so this is my gratuitous immunocytochemistry, immunohistochemistry slide just to, to uh, emphasize the extreme functional and, and genomic heterogeneity among populations of sensory neurons within the dorsal root ganglia. Uh, and these are, uh, this is a combination of a transgenic reporter and, and multiple immunohistochemical labelings uh, showing different subsets, primarily of nociceptors within small diameter unmyelinated neurons that provide the bulk of nociceptive signaling um, in contrast to large diameter myelinated fibers, most of which are low threshold mechanoreceptors. And people have, for decades, painstakingly attempted to find neurochemical markers that distinguish these populations. When I started training, the typical way of doing that was through something like this. You take some antibodies for proteins that you think might be important. You do some staining, figure out which cells are labeled, and then go on to the next antibodies. Uh, In-situ hybridization was also a useful tool. Uh, now the tools have gotten much better and we can use transgenic reporters, uh, but in addition to that, we have some much more powerful tools. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that these, these uh, distinctions, you have the peptidergic nociceptors, which include those that express TRPV1, the heat-gated ion channel that's the receptor for capsaicin and gives hot peppers at their heat. Uh, that, that are responsible for a great deal of, of, particularly for inflammatory pain, for heat hypersensitivity, which we're using as an assay, and they also release pro-inflammatory and vasodilatory peptides such as CGRP and substance P. The non-peptidergic neurons, including those that are, have been traditionally labeled with uh, the plant lectin IB4, People have developed a, a number of genes that identified a number of genes that are selectively expressed in this population, including G-protein coupled receptors, and that serve to allow people to distinguish between these subsets. And similar uh, 
strategies have been performed for the tactile low threshold mechanoreceptors, uh, a small sub, a subset of innocuous C fibers, low threshold uh, mechanoreceptors that are unmyelinated, and A delta nociceptors. Uh, so now I mentioned the, the development of more sophisticated tools for this sort of comprehensive phenotyping of sensory neurons. Uh, and over the last few years, there's several, three or four papers in particular that have come out using RNA-seq to systematically analyze the, all of the transcripts that are expressed by different subsets of neurons. Uh, and these provide an enormous resource for, uh, particularly for hypothesis generation. So instead of going out and buying an antibody to a protein that you think is important, you can go through these published data sets and look at every single transcript that's being expressed by those cells under a particular condition uh, and, and screen large numbers, thousands of genes for selective expression in specific subsets. And we've really used these extensively to uh, help us think about what genes may be important in, in particular pain models. Uh, in particular, a paper by Mike Iadarola looked at uh, transcripts, differences in transcript expression between neurons that express trp one and those that don't. They did that by sorting um, trp one neurons with a transgenic reporter or depleting uh, trp one neurons by ablating them in animals uh, to develop pure populations of cells that, that either are um, include the trp one expressing neurons or that exclude those neurons. And using that system have identified uh, the transcripts that are expressed in those populations. One caveat I should point out here, and you'll see these neurons are called trp one lineage. That's because during development, uh, which uh, the, the trp one expression includes most C fibers which is, how, which is where the uh, transgenic reporter is expressed throughout the life of the animal. Therefore, the neurons that, that are assessed in this, in this analysis include most, most C fibers. And what you see here is a, a list of all of the adenocyclases that are expressed in sensory neurons and their uh, expression levels uh, quantified. And what's interesting is that, so adenylcyclase 5 is the most highly expressed and broadly expressed um, isoform in the DRG. This is not surprising, and uh, there have been some knockout mouse studies, although they haven't been terribly well characterized, but it, they, AC5 does seem to be important for maintenance of, um, of nociceptive thresholds. So clearly a key player for cyclic AMP signaling. But the number two isoform expressed in DRG is adenylcyclase 2, which is one of these type 2 um, receptor, uh, type 2 adenylcyclases. Now, the, the, uh, one of the most useful and important uh, RNA-seq studies recently has been one by uh, Usoskin et al. from Patrick Ernfors lab, where they performed single cell RNA-seq on about 600 neurons. Uh, acutely dissected from, from DRG. And they use this pattern of uh, distribution to show expression in different subsets of populations of neurons that I mentioned. So uh, just to give you a general assessment, these are the tactile fibers, the low threshold, large diameter A fibers, non-peptidergic nociceptors, peptidergic nociceptors, and the low threshold nociceptors. And what you can see is that uh, that if the so each dot is a cell, and the y-axis is the expression level. So there's very high expression in many cells that express AC2, more so than almost any other dental cyclase isoform in the DRG. And switching to a log scale uh, to compare a dental cyclase two versus five. What's interesting is that it, what falls out is that there are two major populations of AC, ADCY2 expressing neurons, a set of large diameter, presumably tactile afferents, and a big population of trp one primarily the trp one expressing nociceptors. Uh, so that got me very excited because it suggested that, that 
this adenylcyclase was actually indeed expressed in sensory neurons. And uh, this model we were developing of adenylcyclase, adenylcyclases that were immune to analgesic GI inhibition could actually be playing an important role in nociceptive signal. Uh, so the first rule of, of using these data sets is that you need to validate uh, the findings that you, the information you derive from them. Uh, here we're using an antibody generated against uh, ADCY2 to look at the distribution in DRG and dorsal horn. And in fact, we see a lot of small diameter neurons labeled. Here you see in red. Uh, they co-localize extensively with uh, trip v one although not exclusively. And in, in the dorsal horn, where nociceptive uh, sensory neurons project, uh, send the unmyelinated axons in the superficial dorsal horn. You see diffuse axonal projections. You also see projections through the dorsal columns, which are likely to be some of these large myelinated afferents, consistent with the idea that there are these two populations of um, AC2 expressing neurons. So is it possible that um, that this could really, that ADCY2 might actually be a mechanism for a transition to, to uh, opioid resistant pain? Or, and I wanna make the, the point that there, there are a couple of ways in which this could be significant. The first is obviously that if you have cyclic AMP signaling that's insensitive to GI inhibition and you're taking opiates for the pain, that's not gonna work very well, right? So it could be a model for uh, opioid insensitive pain. The second is that you, you're one of the most powerful endogenous analgesic systems is descending input uh, from the brainstem into the spinal cord nociceptive circuitry to inhibit input of nociceptive information into the CNS. And those uh, projections act through multiple GI coupled receptors none of which would be effective in suppressing the cyclic AMP signaling generated by adenylcyclase 2. So there are both, both endogenous analgesic systems and exogenous uh, drugs would, would be, uh, show reduced effectiveness if adenylcyclase 2 is, is activated in a chronic pain state. So, and in addition, the concept of uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is a, a phenomenon, a clinical phenomenon where increasing doses of opiates actually increase pain. And that's a, a defining characteristic. Uh, anyone who saw Brian Schmidt's talk a week or so ago, um, he gave a, a pretty dramatic description of a patient with, with profound opioid-induced hyperalgesia where his, his uh, opioid dose was causing intense pain and he was forced to stop taking it. Uh, so the big question uh, for us at that point was, well, so this is all, this is a great model and a great hypothesis, but we don't know whether it's actually true or not. Uh, and many uh, a beautiful hypothesis have been destroyed by the fact that they, they just aren't true. Uh, so this is sort of an evidence-free hypothesis, which usually you prefer to make naturalistic observations on which to base your hypothesis. So we dove in and we developed a um, relationship with Val Watts, who produced um, a, an agon a selective antagonist or inhibitor for adenylcyclase II. Uh, the downside of this drug is that it's a very effective and selective inhibitor of AC2, except for the fact that it also inhibits dopamine receptors, D1 and, and uh, D5 receptors. <coughs> and so we wanted to try and compare uh, any inhibition that we were getting with the AC2 inhibitor uh, with a, an independent uh, dopamine receptor inhibitor that did not block adenylcyclase 2. And so the, this uh, AC, adenyl cyclase inhibitor is this SKF drug. And then we used a, a widely used uh, D1, D5 inhibitor to compare it. First, we looked at, at baseline thermal thresholds and acute nociceptive signaling. And we actually found no significant effect of 
either of these drugs on acute thresholds to a noxious thermal stimulus, which is radiant, radiant heat. So here we're, we're looking at latency for HINPA withdrawal from a, a noxious radiant heat stimulus so that a decrease in latencies represents an increase in sensitivity. Uh, and there was, you can see some small differences. There's a small decrease here in response also just to the vehicle. But, uh, but none of these differences are, are sufficiently robust to be statistically significant. Next, we looked at hyperalgesia induced by injection of capsaicin into the hind pod to uh, induce hyper, uh, heat hyperalgesia. Uh, and the, so the, the decrease in thresholds that you see here is due to the capsaicin injection. So you get a robust decrease in, in latencies, which indicates a, a significant hypersensitivity, uh, which is really not reduced by this AC2 inhibitor. So acute thresholds really don't seem to be impacted by inhibition of adenylcyclase 2. So now this is an example of uh, heat hyperalgesia induced by hindpaw injection of PGE2, uh, which as I told you is, is commonly used as that second stimulus in the hyperalgesic priming model to induce prolonged hyperalgesia. In a naive animal, you get substantial hyperalgesia at 30 minutes. Uh, which is greatly reduced by two hours. Generally, it's gone within a few hours. Certainly by 24 hours, where we're looking here, it's the animals appear to be completely back to normal. Now, when we look in the hyperalgesic priming model, remember we start with an initial insult uh, here, which is an injection of carrageenan into the hind paw, and that ca causes uh, very robust heat hypersensitivity for several days that resolves within a week in our, in our hands with these parameters. Uh, and so this is an example of, of the impact of the carrageenan. By day seven, the animals are back to normal. They look phenotypically just like a naive animal. However, in contrast to the PGE2 uh, stimulus in naive animals, which only lasted a couple of hours, here we get uh, hyperalgesia. And at 72 hours, they're still not completely back to to normal. But what was exciting was that here you can see in, in red um, application of the AC2 inhibitor with the PGE2 greatly reversed, not completely, but substantially reversed the hyperalgesia, the prolonged nature of the hyperalgesia. So by 24 hours, um, you're seeing a big reduction in, in the amount of hyperalgesia that you're getting in the primed animals. Uh, and what was interesting, particularly interesting here, is we were able to recapitulate uh, the findings by John Levine and coworkers that EPAC is required for this hyperalgesic priming. So if you inject an EPAC inhibitor, you can also reverse the hypersensitivity. But the AC2 inhibitor, if anything, was even more effective than an inhibitor of EPAC. And so we were very excited to see that because it, it really suggested that, that AC2 really is playing a critical role. It's required for the full expression of this prolonged hyperalgesia. So then the question is, what are, why, why is this happening? Like, for instance, for, first of all, why, why isn't AC2 activated all the time? It's just like all the other dental cyclases, it's activated by GS. Uh, and then why, how does it become accessible to GS-coupled signaling in the primed state? Uh, and our, our first interpretation, the first model, is that adenylcyclase 2 and EPAC are functionally coupled in some way, um, and that they're part of this molecular switch and the transition from naive to primed, acute to chronic, is permissive for uh, for the activation or possibly the superactivation of adenylcyclase 2. The other possibility is they're not actually functionally physically coupled, but that AC2 is superactivated in the prime state, generating much more adenylcyclase and thus allowing EPAC to be activated. One of the interesting features of EPAC as opposed to protein kinase A is that EPAC requires 
has lower affinity for, for adenyl cyclase. So in order to switch from PKA signaling to EPEC signaling, you need to have a higher concentration, local concentration of cyclic AMP. Uh, so then the big question is, how are we going to go about figuring out what the molecular mechanisms are that are regulating this transition, uh, this mechanism, switch in mechanism? Uh, so it happens that, that adenyl cyclases and, and cyclic AMP signaling are pretty much the poster children for regulation by protein-protein interactions and the scaffolding of macromolecular complexes. Adenyl cyclases are very tightly regulated uh, and targeted to specific subcellular microdomains where the spread of cyclic AMP that's produced by the adenyl cyclase is also tightly restricted by the targeting of phosphodiesterases that chew up the cyclic AMP uh, at the site of the adenyl cyclase itself. So it almost forms a shield over the microdomain that prevents the cyclic AMP from leaking out into other, other regions of the cell. And as a result, you can actually have situations in a given cell where you can have two receptors signaling through, GS-coupled receptors signaling through the same pathway coupled to different microdomains that have different consequences, cellular physiological consequences for the cell because they're targeted to different microdomains. Uh, and for uh, the major mechanism, the major model for targeting of adenyl cyclases and their effectors are this ACAP family of A-kinase-associated proteins, which have uh, a canonical domain for binding of protein kinase A and targeting it to a specific uh, subcellular domain. And aside from that, that is the major definite way to define an ACAP, is this amphipathic helix uh, domain that binds PKA. And the diversity of these proteins is, is amazing. There are more than 50 isoforms in this family that couple PKA to very different combinations of proteins. So in addition to, um, to binding PKA, they, bind, they have sites for multiple other effectors. In many cases, the ACAPs will bind a particular GS-coupled receptor, the adenyl cyclase, the PKA, the phosphodiesterase that chews up the cyclic AMP, uh, in some cases, protein kinase C that's activated downstream of, of the cyclic AMP signaling and EPAC, as well as additional phosphatases and other, and the uh, substrates of the kinases. So this is a massive macromolecular complex. In addition, it has a targeting domain that targets the whole complex to different subcellular domains. And this is an example, a series of examples from John Scott's lab, who's been a real pioneer in identifying ACAP family members. And um, this just shows some, some examples of ACAPs that are specifically targeted to the plasma membrane, like ACAP 79, um, mitochondria, cytoskeleton, um, and ER, I believe. And so all of these, oh, and um, the perinuclear membrane, all of these different ACAP isoforms are specialized to target uh, composites, com uh, complexes of signaling molecules that are assembled in order to generate a particular outcome given a particular input. And the next, the next step in this, um, in this organizational structure is the concept of dynamic scaffolding, which is that in, in response to an, the, an environmental stimulus for the cell, you can actually change either the subcellular localization of a particular adenyl cyclase or the output um, of cyclic AMP production. So you can swap in a different kinase or a different kinase substrate into the complex and generate a different outcome for the exact same signal uh, that you were producing prior to the environmental stimulus. So this is a, a major mechanism for a very rapid change, uh, plastic change in signaling consequences. It doesn't require necessarily any transcriptional regulation. 
and it can occur on the time scale of, of seconds to minutes, um, but regulating the outcome in response to a given input, uh, which to me sounds a lot like plastic changes in nociceptor sensitivity. And so here, we're adapting this model to the model of, of hyperalgesic priming. Under normal conditions, you might expect to see carrageenan leading to an inflammatory response that activates GS-coupled receptors, activates adenyl cyclase. I've put adenyl cyclase 5 in here as, as the most broadly expressed family member, coupled to an ACAP. We don't really know what it is here, but signaling through protein kinase A to generate uh, a, a temporary increase in nociceptor hypersensitivity. In response to priming, our model is that now you've switched, at least in part, to uh, activation of adenyl cyclase 2, possibly through a different ACAP, or through a change in, in binding by the same ACAP. And now you're able to activate EPAC in response to activation of AC2, which drives activation of, of protein kinase C. So that's our model. And now then you have, the problem is we don't know what's getting phosphorylated by the protein kinase C. And that's a real challenge. Uh, it's one thing to identify the kinase, but it's pretty tough to identify which proteins are getting phosphorylated and leading, presumably those are the, at the business end, those are the, the proteins that are actually changing the response properties of the neurons, whether those are receptors or ion channels. Um, that drive uh, excitability and, and transduction sensitivity in nociceptors. So are there ACAPs in sensory neurons? We went back to the RNA-seq data set. And of the more than 50 family members, we found 25 that are expressed in sensory neurons to varying degrees. This is an order of, of expression level. <clears throat> and what's ironic is out of these 25, the only one that's been functionally analyzed and found to have important functions in nociceptive signaling is this ACAP5, also known as ACAP150 or 79, which is the single most single least expressed ACAP in all sensory neurons. So there's a, an incredible opportunity here, an untapped diversity of, of regulatory mechanisms for uh, an incredibly diverse regulation of cyclic AMP-dependent mechanisms in sensory neurons, almost entirely untouched. In particular, of course, we want to know about EPAC signaling and regulation coupling of adenyl cyclase and EPAC. So we used some online uh, bioinformatics tools to screen the literature and known protein-protein interactions for ACAPs that have been identified to bind EPAC and or adenyl cyclase 2. We found of those 25, we found six that have been known to bind either EPAC or AC2. Uh, and this is, these are number of reads by RNA-seq to give us an idea of how abundantly they're expressed. Uh, EPAC is expressed in two isoforms, EPAC1 and EPAC2, which I don't have time to talk about, but, but some bind some ACAPs and some others. And so this gives us a place to start. Now we've gone from 50 plus ACAPs, which is completely overwhelming, to six that might be involved. All of these are expressed in DRG. They might be involved in, in this process and provides a place to at least start looking at, at these mechanisms. Uh, so then we got very ambitious and we decided uh, that what we were going to do was try a, a a, a technique completely new to us that I've been building up to for a few years to really try to dissect how these complexes are assembled and how they change in response to stimulation. So if there really is dynamic scaffolding, how do these scaffolding complexes change in response to stimulation in vitro or in pain models in vivo? And so this, this is a technique called affinity purification mass spectrometry. And the simple version is just we're, we're co-immunoprecipitating proteins of interest, whether those are GP, the GPCR, the ACAP, or the enzyme, the adenyl cyclase, or EPAC itself. Uh, if we can get a good antibody, we can, we can pull it down along with its uh, binding partners. Uh, 
and then separate those on the, just by running them on a gel, on a, a protein gel, cut chunks out of the gel, and send them off for uh, LCMS, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, identify the proteins, and then use bioinformatics tools to analyze what's known in the world about their interactions uh, with other proteins that we're interested in. Uh, this is all, this is a, sounds very simple and straightforward. The biggest hurdle, uh, but not the only hurdle, is that antibodies are notoriously fickle. Uh, and antibody companies are even more fickle. Uh, and so just because you have an antibody that works great for immunohistochemistry or for Western blot doesn't mean it will work for immunoprecipitation. Uh, they're often included with carrier proteins that stabilize the, the protein and make it difficult to conjugate them to columns or, or beads. And, they're, and so this has been an enormous voyage of discovery and heartache and sweat, blood, and tears, mostly, uh, well, really for, for every one of us in the lab at one point or another. And, and I'm very excited that we've come really a long way and, and are, are starting to really get some interesting interesting results. Uh, and so what I had, I had hoped that we could do is to use uh, what I'm referring to here as interse intersectional proteomics to get a really rigorous answer as to uh, how these proteins interact. You can imagine that if we were to pull down a given adenyl cyclase, that might be doing different things in different cells uh, in different neurons, you also have lots of non-neuronal cells in the DRG or in the spinal cord or the brain or wherever you want to look, wherever we're doing these studies. Uh, and so that if we, if we can look, identify all the binding partners of adenyl cyclase 2 and the binding partners of EPAC and the binding partners of PKC and look at where at the overlap of those complexes and then hopefully find specific ACAPs Uh, that, that are bound by all of these, that we could begin to really assemble these complexes and figure out how the system is working. Um, and so we, we got off to a good start identifying some antibodies for dental cyclase 2, which we first used for the immunohistochemistry that I showed you. We've now gone through four antibodies for dental cyclase 2. Uh, we picked our best one, used, did our affinity purification mass spec, very excited to get the results back. Got tons of proteins, none of which was adenyl cyclase 2, which means that anything in there is not binding to adenyl cyclase 2 and that it was, it's junk. So that was very disheartening. But this is, this is an antibody problem, and this is a tall order to try and do this type of analysis. Um, some would say even unrealistic. Uh, but we are using our intersectional, anal intersectional analysis to try and, and target all directions at once and then converge into the center. Uh, and we've now had some success looking at protein kinase C alpha, which is one of the key PKC isoforms that's been identified as, as activated by uh, EPAC. We're moving forward with, with analyzing epsilon, both of which have excellent antibodies generated against them. So we were very hopeful. And in fact, uh, we have our first round of uh, PKC alpha results. And here what we're doing is we're using, a, in this case, not the priming model, but the complete Freund's adjuvant model of, of inflammation. And we, so we took protein samples from the DRGs of animals that received an injection of CFA in the hind paw or animals that received vehicle, extracted the protein, um, performed the co-immunoprecipitation for PKC alpha, ran the samples by mass spec, and identified differences in, in the representation in the binding partners that are associated with PKC alpha between vehicle and inflamed. I should point out this is really challenging because uh, this is a great approach for when you have an infinite amount of sample. Like if you're growing liters of cell, co of, uh, cell lines, uh, and stimulating them in vitro. Uh, we are using lumbar L2 through 5 or L3 through 5 ganglia because we're inflaming the foot. So you can't take the other ganglia because they're not 
Uh, they're not innervating the inflamed tissue. Um, so we're using large number of animals to generate these samples. It's very labor intensive. But here, but this I think is very promising. So this, here we actually found protein kinase C alpha. We see a two and a half fold increase in the representation of alpha in these samples um, in CFA compared to vehicle, uh, which is very similar to what we see by a simple Western blot for PKC alpha in, in um, DRGs from inflamed animals. We see an increase probably due to an increase in, in transcription for PKC alpha. Uh, you can see we, we pull down a very large number of proteins. And this is a, poses a major challenge to analysis. And Ben Harrison is helping us out with bioinformatic tools and approaches to really crunching these data and trying to get something useful out of them. One of the signatures of these sorts of experiments is you get very excited, you get your data and you, to see the results and get the answer of what is the basis of, of the transition from acute to chronic pain. And you have no idea what any of these things are and you realize that this doesn't provide the answer. This just allows you to, to, it lets you know what the questions are. It gives you the opportunity to, to ask the right questions. And so I, I don't have time to go into all, of we've, all that we've found here, but I will say that we identified three ACAPs. Uh, and so we're on, we're on the first step of our intersectional proteomics approach in trying to identify the convergence of, of these elements into, lar into specific macromolecular complexes. Uh, all right, so I wanna, I wanna stop there for the moment and, and switch gears and talk a little bit about the, the second arm of this giant project, uh, which is trying to figure out what EPAC is doing, uh, or in particular, the EPAC activation of protein kinase C in sensory neurons that causes the change in hypersensitivity. So the, the key questions are, um, what are the proteins that regulate neuronal response properties in response to activation of EPAC? And why do they cause a persistent change in hypersensitivity when in naive animals you only get a, an acute transient response? And it's, a, it's really tough to go from a kinase, which you've identified as, as being involved by knocking it out or inhibiting it with a pharmacological uh, inhibitor to saying, okay, what are the proteins that are actually getting phosphorylated? Uh, and what we've uh, dived into in trying in a, a way to try and address this is uh, what we call, we're calling PKC substrate phosphoprofiling, which is, is just a way of looking specifically at proteins that are phosphorylated by PKC in response to a specific stimulus. And then we, we can either selectively activate uh, EPAC in culture or selectively inhibit EPAC in response to a general stimulus for a GS coupled receptor like, like PGE2 to look at which, which proteins, uh, what bands we get, what characteristic profile of bands we get from a given stimulus uh, in DRG neurons and how those, that banding profile changes in response to stimulation of EPAC. In the perfect world, what we would see is that when you, when you activate a GS coupled receptor, um, you get a particular profile of bands. And then if you activate EPAC specifically, you get an altered profile of bands with some overlap. And the ones that are specific for EPAC are, are the ones that you're really excited about, right? In practice, uh, it's quite challenging, and you can see that there, there's a real diversity of bands uh, in, these, in these blots. So there are, not surprisingly, PKC is a, is a in general, is a ubiquitous family of, of proteins. They do a lot of different things, phosphorylate a lot of proteins. And the key is really um, narrowing the field down to the ones that you're really interested in. So this is, a, again, you don't want to take the word of a company for the selectivity of an antibody. So this is an antibody we're using that selectively bind, selectively recognizes phosphoserine residues within the consensus sequence recognized by PKC for phosphorylation. Now, it's not going to be 100% selective, if only because some phosphoserine, some serine residues are phosphorylated by both PKA and PKC. So there are all, 
there's always going to be some there's always going to be some very uh, some slop some uh, you're never going to be able to to say with a 100% certainty that with a broad-based stimulus, like an in vivo insult, that this band is generated by PKC. But what we can say is that when we selectively activate PKC with 4 ball ester, PMA, we get a big increase in signal intensity, and a whole, we get a whole bunch of bands labeled. Uh, we always see a little bit of staining in baseline, suggesting there's ongoing activity of PKC, and we can block those bands with a panel of selective inhibitors for PKC. And when we use, um, even if we stimulate with a GS coupled receptor like PGE2, if we block with PKA inhibitors, remember this is supposed to be a PKC selective antibody, the PKA inhibitors don't reduce the banding pattern that we're getting in uh, using this antibody. So we feel pretty good about the fact that we're looking at PKC activity even when we're stimulating the GS uh, cyclic AMP pathway. Uh, and Diana has, has really gone to town with this approach um, and is, is really pushing Western blots to their limit in analyzing um, changes that we see in response to application of PG2 or EPAC uh, in the PKC phosphorylation profile. And by what she's done is actually quantify the banding profiles uh, for individual band, identify individual bands with a high resolution scan of the blot, and then quantify using software, densitometry software, quantify changes in band intensity in response to um, stimulation or inhibition of EPAC. So ESI09 is a selective EPAC inhibitor. And what you can see is, there, is that there's a dramatic decrease in, in the banding profile and in the intensity um, that you get with PG2 when you block EPAC. Now this makes sense because what we're thinking is that the only way you get PKC activity is 
to reproduce this and generate our own columns. And now we have a relatively inexpensive and efficient way to, to enrich our proteins. Uh, and what, what uh, we found in DRG now is something that looks like this, where we have much better separation of proteins, better signal, uh, and a few new, pro new bands emerging that we weren't able to resolve before. So in particular, you see this band, the, probably the major band here that's, that's altered by manipulation of EPAC is this band about 41 KD that essentially disappears, um, that occur, appears with stimulation with PGE2 and disappears when you block EPAC, suggesting this is a major protein in DRG that's phosphorylated downstream of EPAC activation by GS coupled receptors. So we cut it out, send it off for mass spec, and the bottom line is these, these are our results. This is abundance. Uh, essentially, it's a measure of abundance, increasing abundance for, um, here we're using HCPT, which is a selective stimulus for EPAC, activator of EPAC, versus the inhibitor ESI. Um, so here we're increasing abundance in the uh, EPAC activation condition here in the um, EPAC inhi inhibited condition, and we have one major hit, our most abundant hit, which is dramatically increased in the EPAC condition or EPAC activation condition. And we got the identity PDHA1. Well, what is PDHA1? I'd never heard of that. Uh, look it up, go to gene cards, look up the gene, and it turns out it's pyruvate dehydrogenase. And I thought, oh no. Here we have some generic ubiquitous housekeeping enzyme. It's complete junk, uh, just contaminating our samples. Uh, we get nothing out of this. And so that was really demoralizing. Uh, so pyruvate dehydrogenase, of course, is the mitochondrial enzyme component of the, of the complex, which generates acetyl-CoA from pyruvate uh, and drives the, among other things, the, well, the, the citric acid, the TCA cycle, and the uh, mitochondrial membrane potential. But then when I started thinking about it, this actually could be really interesting. So Stan Thayer had done some really outstanding studies uh, at the University of Minnesota, looking at the role of mitochondria in buffering calcium in response to rapid stimulation of nociceptors and DRG neurons in general. And what he found is you, uh, with rapid, with high firing of DRG neurons, you get this big shoulder on, this is calcium in, imaging, so this is a calcium spike, uh, calcium influx through voltage-gated channels. You get a big shoulder on the descending limb of the transient with a very slow, broad, gradual release of calcium. And if you block um, the, the um, if you uncouple the mitochondria, the TCA cycle, you, you eliminate this, uh, this shoulder. You, just, you get a higher amplitude, so you get a bigger amplitude, so calcium concentration goes higher, and you lose this long, slow, uh, release and this is mediated by so this is mediated by mitochondria. They take up calcium and suppress total calcium concentrations, which have the potential to kill the cell, and then they gradually release it into the uh, cytoplasm, which and and cytoplasmic calcium concentrations play major roles in regulating intracellular signaling pathways, second messengers, and also activity dependent gene expression. So this is going to have big impacts on, on both of those processes, gene expression and um, regulation of existing signaling machinery. And the, the magnitude of this response goes up with increased firing. So when cells are really upset, you're going to have a much bigger contribution of the mitochondria. So maybe this could be real after all. Could we validate it? Well, we got an antibody for PDHA1. Now, this is total, not phosphoprotein. And if you, you can see, here's our, our band in response to, to PGE2, perfectly overlapped with, um, with the band for PDHA1. And in fact, when we applied ESI to block EPAC, 
we, we got a reduction in the amount of PDHA1. Now, what's important here is this is phospho-enriched protein. So it's total PDHA1 in the sample, but we're only pulling down phosphoprotein. So we're getting less PDHA1 in our samples, presumably when it's not phosphorylated in the present, when you block EPAC. Uh, now, pyruvate dehydrogenase is inhibited by pyruvate dehydrogenase kinases, which respond to a variety of, of uh, metabolic stimuli to suppress the function of the enzyme. And so we thought, oh, well, this must be how it's working. But, but uh, we used an inhibitor of the kinase, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, uh, dichloroacetate, to block phosphorylation by the kinase had no effect. And that makes sense because we're looking at PKC signaling, not other enzymes. So it's always possible that there would be a false positive. But um, it doesn't seem to be the case. So this appears to be a novel mechanism for the regulation of pyruvate dehydrogenase by GS-coupled receptors uh, at the plasma membrane. And in fact, if you use a, an online tool with an algorithm to identify phospho residues for, signal, for uh, phosphorylation by PKC, the residue phosphorylated by PD kinase is not uh, recognized as a, as a phosphocyte for, for a protein kinase C. But there are four, four other high-confidence sites on the protein with unknown function by phosphorylation. So I want to wrap up here because I'm running out of time. But the, so we're really excited about this result because it suggests that, that uh, there is a, a very unexpected and completely novel um, target for EPAC-dependent PK signaling. We have a lot of, of work ahead of us to try and figure out what the significance of, of the signaling is for uh, for chronic pain and, and nociceptor sensitization in general. Uh, but I'm really intrigued to look at the um, functional consequences of, of mitochondrial buffering on calcium signaling in, in nociceptors. Um, and I think I'll skip this, just skip to my acknowledgments. Um, everybody in my lab has, has worked intensively on these developing these protocols and techniques, including uh, my uh, graduated, uh, graduate student, Monsi Shah, who finished up her work at the University of Pittsburgh the year before last. Uh, Tamara's lab has helped us out a lot with um, conceptualizing these, the behavior experiments and performing them, as has Ivy Burquist. Ben is helping us with the bioinformatics approaches. Um, and of course, our funding. Um, with which we, without which we couldn't perform these experiments. And I'll take any questions. I was wondering if there's any EPAC knockout animals and how they exhibit chronic pain. There are. Um, and uh, let's see, the EPAC one, so they're, there's a whole other backstory here in the distinctions between EPAC1 and EPAC2. Uh, the traditional hyperalgesic priming looks at mechanical hypersensitivity, and which is primarily mediated by the IB4 non-peptidergic neurons. Uh, and EPAC knockout mice were used to implicate EPAC1 in particular in that model. We have decided to look for a variety of reasons at um, at heat hyperalgesic priming, which has not been used previously, in part because we think that that's where a role for AC2, ADCY2 is. And that hasn't been assessed. Uh, but EPAC1 does not seem to have a big impact on heat hyperalgesia. So we're excited that there could actually be, um, I mean, it may really be as simple as that there are actually, there's one isoform for mechanical pain and one for heat, which almost sounds too simple to be true. Uh, this isn't really a full form thought, but have you, and I also don't know the status of the equipment, have you thought, given any thought to using the flipper machine to be able to utilize in vitro tools that you can't translate to an in, in vivo model? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. We thought about that a lot. The, the main problem 
is that I hate cell lines because cell lines don't tell you anything about nociceptors, even DRG-derived cell lines. Uh, in fact, the neurons in the DRG are so diverse that there are different signaling pathways, as I just mentioned, EPAC1 and EPAC2. There are, those are two separate populations of nociceptors, and they have, they're functionally distinct, but they're, they're DRG neurons, they're peripheral sensory neurons, they're C fibers, they're nociceptors, and yet the signaling pathways are fundamentally different. So the likelihood that we could actually find out something useful in a cell line, I think, is really limited. The problem is then we have to deal with the reality of getting you know, a few tens of thousands of cells or maybe 100,000 cells in per animal instead of a couple of million that we could whip off whenever we want. A question and a suggestion. Um, suggestion first being that, and yeah, as you mentioned, PDHBs in mitochondrial enzyme, which being a bacteriologist, you know, those are my people, right? <laughs> so they're actually ingrained bacteria. So PDHB has been, um, shown in the past, especially five or six years, to be a notorious moonlighting protein in bacteria. So it actually has a bajillion functions that are not remotely related to its original description. So you might want to poke through a bit of that literature because something might jump out as... So what about alpha? Um, so sorry, that, alpha, alpha as so well. alpha yeah. is... Yep. Exactly, both of them are. And so you they might want to... hit you up for references. Because that would be too. extremely but helpful. It, it, yeah, something might jump out as, oh my God, that's what it's doing. Um, so then my kind of pie-in-the-sky question would be, you now have all these kind of nifty targets that you're looking at from a mechanistic standpoint to try to figure these things out. Is it plausible to you given that you started your talk by talking about how chronic pain is, and particularly neuropathies, are sort of squishy to define. Does it seem plausible to you someday you could come up with some kind of molecular diagnostic for any of these things based on some of these targets? Because that would be really cool. I think, I mean, people are really pushing in that direction. I think that would be enorm of enormous benefit if you think about you know, diagnostically, how you tell the difference be between someone with CRPS versus fibromyalgia versus opioid addiction, if you could just give them a blood test. And there was, there was just a science paper, I think, describing an Australian, no, they just presented it at a, at a, pay, at a meeting last week, a blood test that measures, uses hyperspectral imaging to measure the color of immune cells in the skin in chronic pain patients. And they claim that it's diagnostic for chronic pain. I, I would have a lot of questions about that, but obviously it would be enormously valuable. And if you think about all the patients who have been told that they're hysterical and to go get a psych consult. Yeah. yeah. How fast can these changes occur between, uh, I believe, the, the ACAP that you're looking at, the different forms of it? How fast can a cell shift from one to the other? Well, one of the things that I think is really exciting is that this is a, a mechanism for the cell to induce changes that can occur, I mean, potentially in seconds for transient effects. You would, you would think that the more stable the response, it's likely that the slower it would be to occur. It doesn't have to be true, but, but that would be where I would start. But you can imagine, I mean, in some cases, all the only uh, process, actual process involved is translocation of a protein from one domain to another, or binding, ch changing in binding from one ACAP to another. So you, it could be easily minutes. Do any of these involve translation of genes? Are these proteins all there to start with? Um, so they certainly can, and in some cases they are regulated by transcription. We were totally unable to find any significant changes in adenyl cyclase transcription or the ACAPs that we looked at in either inflammatory pain models or nerve injury. And that's been reproduced by in related models by, by a number of other people. So I think that... Adenylcyclases are so tightly regulated at the 
at the post-transcriptional, post-translational level, that they're, it's, it's just too inefficient to regulate them at the transcriptional level. That doesn't mean that there aren't examples where that does occur, but I think here we're not looking at The reason I ask about the time is that um, y there is the problem of, since chronic pain is defined as you know, three months or whatever, you actually have the situation where people wait to see if it's going to hang around that long so they can diagnose it. And then by the time they've done that, there is a relationship between uh, remitting and the length of time it's been around and it's a negative relationship so being able to pick something up very quick I think at one point they were talking about redefining terms I don't know it, it and I think the American Academy of Pain Medicine has has adopted uh, eudynia or maldynia as opposed to acute and chronic pain to get away from the temporal sequence because it, there are individuals who can get injured and they will now develop a pattern of pain which is uh, going to be that you can predict it's going to become chronic you just don't have the ability to demonstrate it you just wait long enough and it does it's just that pain is out of proportion with the, the type of injury that they're experiencing yet there's no way to diagnose it at this time and say yes that's going to do it yeah so I think that's that's sort of the, the critical issue. Like ultimately, that's our goal. Our goal in doing this work is to get away from this temporal-based model. I mean, the problem is that's all we've got. So you know, you make the best. You do do the best you can with what you have. If the pain responds well to NSAIDs, then you're fine. If if not, three months later, six months later, you may be in trouble. Or becoming tolerant to your opiates. So I'm really excited in looking at these, you know, what are these, what are the engrams of chronic pain? Any other questions? Great, thanks very much.